I'd like to call the College of Complexes to order, please. My name is Tim. I'll be kind of moderating and filming tonight. And I'm sure we'll have, I'll have a little bit of assistance from Andy Anderson later on. I'd like to thank Charlie again for getting the college organized and booking our speaker tonight. Uh, the college consists of the following format. First, there'll be a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period. And after that, we will have the rebuttals for it. We need to leave the restaurant about 8.45, so, you know, We'll have to, you know, clear out and end at 8.45 so we can clear the restaurant off. The tonight on is Sid Cohen on the nature of the state. Let's welcome, with a rousing round of applause, comrade <laughs> Sid Cohen. Um, on the nature of the state, what is a state? What is, what is its purpose? For one thing, a state has a standing army, a policing body, jails, courts, judges, and its purpose is to repress working classes. Its purpose is not only to, uh, is also to protect the ruling classes. In Rome and Athens, the patrician class, the slave owning class, the um, in feudalism to protect the aristocracy and the lord of the manor. In capitalist society, the capitalists against the working class. The first police were the slaves themselves. Men on horseback and were armed and were given their freedom. In primitive society, there was no private property. All the land were held in common. There is no concept of a pri of private property. They don't know anything about private property. When Columbus landed in the New World, Hispaniola and the Dominican Republic in Haiti, the indigenous population were very peaceful. And the Columbus tried to make slaves out of them. But the people resisted and some committed suicide. And the rest died from disease that Columbus uh, brought with him to the New World. This according to Howard Zinn in his book a people's history of, of the new world. Into the mic, said. Yeah. Okay. So the Spanish brought the slaves from Africa. That's why Haiti is a black nation. In South America, the natives were in the higher stage of society, the upper stage of barbarism. Cortez and Bizarro believed that the Incas were living in a feudalistic society. Believed that the Atahualpa, who was the head Inca, was like a general, he thought he was, Ethelwalpa was a king, but he was more like a general in the army. The Incas, the Incas had, didn't have civilization yet. There was no king or nobles. When they went to war, all people who were old enough and strong enough were automatically in the army. There was no standing army. like in civilization. They were very close to um, civilization, but to be in civilization, they had to have a written language. And they didn't have a written language. They were able to do brain surgery, and they were able to make rivers 
reverse itself. The Incas believe that the Spaniards were gods because they had horses and their skin was white. And they thought the horses and the men were one, one being in itself. Cortez captured Atahualpa and held him until the Incas surrendered. The Incas were very suspicious, very young. Uh, were very, um, well, superstitious, you might say. And and the uh, and the Spaniards controlled Peru. They done this with a few arms and horses. And this, and once they captured uh, Atahualpa, they controlled the rest of the nation. It was that easy? <coughs> In all primitive societies, they had what you call gens, or as um, most people in the world call them clans. No man can marry in his own clan. So uh, the man never knew his offspring. The women only knew who their child was, what they called mother right. Only when they had a settled agri agriculture and animal husbandry, they had a surplus of food. Only when they had a surplus did the male want to know who his offspring was. Next to the mic set, please. Yeah, okay. I have to separate these papers. Thank God. So he could pass on his wealth to his offspring. That that the beginning of father right. And the father became the leader in the household. Before that, women were on an equal footing in society. When they held their councils, women voted on as an equal on an equal footing with the men. They saw, done so by raising of the hand. There was no discrimination of the female. Women enjoyed the same freedom as the male. It's only in civilization that women became second-class citizens. Of course, there is a division of labor in primitive society. Women bear the children. And don't go to war. Take care of the household. How do these societies come to being, have come to have kings and nobles and other ro royalty. We don't know exactly what happened in feudal in feudal society, but the owning class made made the general the king, and his family became royalty: dukes, duchesses, and nobles. The land owned. The land-owning class became the ruling class over the serfs, and society was run into two. Society had to have a state, an organ to keep the serfs from revolting. In, in serfdom, there was another class in what we call the guild, in which craftsmen made furniture, clothes, Stagecoaches, ships, sails, fine art, etc. They, they became the future capitalist class. When Columbus discovered the New World in 1492, they needed ships, they needed sails, they needed clothes, and, they, and other goods, and a very much increased demand. 
that stimulated the economy. And by stimulating the economy and production, capitalism comes into being, especially with the discovery of the new world. So now you have the capitalists were and workers as the two main classes. The workers work from dusk to dawn under miserable conditions. The capitalists needed a state to keep the workers from revolting. The workers, the only workers could get better and was in better conditions was to form a union. At first, the merry old England, merry old England, the government, the government called the, the, the called um, combinations in Ottawa, and now as, as being in Ottawa, but what they were doing essentially, anybody that tried to form a union, they called them combinations, and these combinations were outlawed. They don't want no unions. So the workers had to keep on trying and always under pressure from the government. In 1929, we had the Great Depression. In 1933, FDR became the president. And he enacted the New Deal. The conditions were so bad that he, he recommended the unions, and he did that because workers in Flint, Michigan, took over the factories and auto plants. The unemployed level was about 25% during the Roosevelt administration. Some say more. At that time, the Communist Party had something like 100,000 members during the Great Depression. Uh, in Russia, the Bolsheviks In Russia, the Bolsheviks only had about 14,000 members in 1917 and took over Russia. So FDR enacted the New Deal and they had different programs like the WBA, Works Progress Administration. He had workers building roads, cutting down trees, and, and, and other forms of work. He had the Tennessee Valley Authority that put uh, electricity in the different parts of the South. And he also had art programs, writers program, etc. They put people to work. The government was the employer of last resort and had Social Security for people over 65. But most people in 1933 did not live to be over 65. So it was a farce to large degree. His programs put people to work, unemployment went down. Uh, unemployment went down, but in 1937, unemployment went back up again. The reason for this is because the capitalists were afraid he was going towards socialism. Actually, the war took us out of the Depression. If we look at history, in 1917, when the Russian Revolution took place, the Bolsheviks had only about 14,000 members, like I said. But the U.S. Communist Party had 100,000 members. That's why the U.S. ruling class, at least some of them, were fearful of a communist takeover. FDR brought us the New Deal. When we look back at the sexual revolutions, as it's sort of like the Russian, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, Korea, Cuba, and Vietnam, 
The first that was done was to break up the old state and put in their own army, navy, police, and prison system, and judges. They learned this from the Paris Commune in 1871. The workers of Paris rose up and took over Paris, but they were defeated after holding Paris for about two months. The reason for this, they failed to march against the old state and smash the old state. We learned from history. In 1971, Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile. He did not break up the old state and allowed Augusto Pinochet to stay as head of the army to stay in power, a fatal mistake after winning the election. He had discussions with Fidel Castro, and Fidel Castro told him about the reason for the state under capitalism. Allende told him that the army was democratic in Chile and had been since the founding of the country. It had a Senate, a long history of democracy, as long as the United States. But in 1973, the U.S. Empire had, him, had Henry Kissinger call General Pinochet, Pinochet to stage a counter-revolution and told General Pinochet to set up demonstrations by the middle class to have marches and bang pots and pans in the street to, de to disrupt commerce and cause anarchy in Chile. Then President Allende was assassinated and something like 30,000 were killed by the new fascist government. In 1871, the Paris Commune took place. The workers took over the factories. Every worker received the same pay as managers. All received the same pay. The affairs of the state were run by the workers themselves. All were on the first experiment in socialism. Karl Marx called it the storming of heaven. That failed, they failed to smash the capitalist state, a lesson learned by Lenin and the Bolsheviks. That's why the revolution was a success in 1917. Also the Chinese, the Cuban, the Vietnam, and North Korea revolutions. When it comes to today, we have the case of McDonald, uh, Jason McDonald, and the killing by the cops of, uh, uh, of that uh, Jason, Mc no, what was his name? McQuan. McDonald, McQuan McDonald. The, the cops always get away with it because they're part of the state. They always get a light sentence, and most of the time, never, and they don't uh, really put them in prison or anything. But in this case, they had pictures to show that it was just an outright killing. It was nothing else. It was just a bloody, a cold-blooded murder of an innocent black person. So he got away from it by you know, seven years. How could you give somebody that does uh, this type of assassination and murder seven years? It's ridiculous. There is, there's a saying, whom the gods want to destroy, they first make mad. Capitalism is willing to destroy all life so it can make a profit. That is madness. If we look back in history and the labor movement, we find all sorts of times that the government brought out the National Guard or the Army to break strikes. Around the early 20th century, I, well, I lost those papers, but uh, about the early 20th century, we had a lot of things happen. And some of the things that happened, like for instance, right here in um, Chicago, 
you had General Electric, which was on 22nd Street. And the workers went on on strike, and the, and the uh, National Guard was sent for. And what happened, some of them ran away, and the National Guard shot the workers in the back. They just killed them outright. And if you look at the Rockefellers, the Rockefellers had uh, mines in Colorado. They had uh, copper mines in Colorado. And the copper miners went on strike. So what did he do? He brought out the Army or the National Guard, sometimes the Pinkerton Agency, who was in the boots with the uh, government to kill workers. So he killed a lot of workers, and he got a very bad name for it. So what did he do? He founded the Rockefeller Foundation in order to whitewash his name. And if you look at other capitalists, like the Carnegie Corporation, he hired a man called Frick. This man, Frick, was very aggressive toward the workers. And one day, Frick wanted to get up a hill in order to get the other side of Pittsburgh to the suburbs. He couldn't get up the hill. So what did he do? He called up the governor and said, you have to take down that embankment so I can get up the hill. So the government took down the embankment, and that whole suburb was flooded, and a lot of people were killed. So what happened was, Carnegie, in order to get away from it, he went to uh, Scotland for a number of years. That's where he was born. And he stood there for a number of years, and then he came back and founded the Carnegie Foundation. So what they do is try to whitewash their names. That's what they always try to do. But the state is always against the workers and for the ruling classes. And if you look at strikes around the, around the country, any time you see troops there or Pinkertons or na the National Guard trying to break up the strike. So the state always works for the capitalist class. It's not the capitalist class or the feudal class or the, uh, or, or the aristocracy and the nobles or in slavery for the patrician class. So it's always like that. The state has to be done away with eventually. Now there's two different types of solutions to that. One solution is by the anarchists that say the state has to dissolve right away as soon as the workers take over. But the communists say that's not realistic because the, the workers don't know how to run a government yet. They have to be in the government and start running it and over a period of time they learn how to run it and then you can do away with the state. With the state. And what they mean by doing away with the state is to have a society not run by a ruling class, but run by workers themselves, and no need for any ruling class or any state. And it would be um, sort of like an organization of things. It wouldn't have nothing to do with uh, repression or coercion. So a state always comes into being because they want to uh, suppress the uh, people that work for them, and the people that work for them make all the profit. What do you need capitalists when the people themselves are, are doing all the work? And the capitalists and the other uh, lords of antiquity, that's all they do is sit around, write uh, different things. Uh, they own this thing, they own that, and they get dividends every so often. And they're constantly looking for the dividends. Under capitalism, the only thing that counts, really, is the fact that they make a profit. That's all they care about. That's it. That's all it. Right. Yeah. All right, Sid, take some questions. All right, Sid, are you ready to take questions? Who can moderate, please? Yeah, okay. What happened to the other papers? <laughs> I handed them to you. Yeah. Put them in there. I'm They're probably listening. They're in there somewhere. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, let's go to questions. I'm moderate. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm moderate. I'm moderate. Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Sid, there are a lot of different countries, and some of them seem to be fairly successful and fairly uh, organized. And uh, things seem to be going well. For uh, instance, the Nordic countries. Yeah, I understand. And 
uh, even Canada and New Zealand yeah. seem to be doing pretty well. well. That's what they they're all about. capitalist countries. Yeah. But I mean, they're they're a form of capitalism. So uh, would you say they're really countries where they they ought to get rid of those? Well, what it is, you have to go back in history to Germany under Otto von Bismarck, who came into power around 1880 or so. And Otto von Bismarck realized that the workers were always going on strike, always complaining, and disrupted, and disrupted the economy. So what he did, he put in some reforms. And the reforms are like Rousseau put in. Like, well, he done more than, a little more than Rousseau. Free health care, social security system, uh, a program to educate in schools, and all different types of programs. But underneath, there's still a capital state. What they've done is reform the capital state, and that's what Ber Bernie Sanders is about. That's called social democracy. Uh, Marx was winning all the elections in Germany. One election after another, his party was called social democracy. So Otto von Bismarck took over that name and reformed capitalism to a certain degree in order to, to um, uh, pacify the workers. But it's still underneath exploitation. They're still exploiting people. Actually, like you work eight hours a day, let's say. Maybe four of those hours or five of those hours, you're working for yourself. But the other four hours, you're working for the capitalists. So it's a form of slavery. It's not as bad as slavery. It's not as bad as feudalism. But still, it's a form of slavery. And eventually, has to be gotten rid of. Not only that, it causes a lot of wars. A lot of people go nuts because of an insecurity like it's happening right now. In the United States, people are killing each other because there's so much unemployment that they don't count. And people are so disenfranchised and angry, they start killing one another. So that's what capitalism is. Thank you. All right. Okay. Sid, why do you think that the, that the uh, process that produces jobs for the last 300 years and has bettered mankind through the, through the implementation of capitalism and free trade is the source of all the evil in the world when I would contend that it's probably the source of all that we've been able to achieve. Now I do understand there is some exploitative uh, yeah. things in there, but Adam Smith you know, would rail against what we call, uh, uh, it's called, it's not called capitalism, he calls it, uh, mercantilism. Mercantilism. Yeah. Now, where, what's the difference in your mind between mercantilism and capitalism? Well, mercantilism is just the beginning of capitalism. It's actually free <laughs> enterprise. You have a lot of small enterprises uh, producing things. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot more productive than under feudalism, where they have the guilds, where a few people produce things. So a factory system is, is more progressive. And capitalism was more progressive than feudalism. And feudalism was more progressive over slavery. But now we're running into something that we never had before. And that is the, the warming or the change in, in the uh, climate. And the capitalists are not able, not, not willing to do anything about it. That's all they want is a small profits every uh, quarter or whatever. And so if we keep on going the way we are, we're going there's not going to be any life on this planet. Capitalism has run out of, of, uh, of, of progress. It's, a, it's an impediment to progress at this point in history. Everything, like a, a human being is born, it grows, and eventually it dies. Everything in society is also a form of matter, and it goes into a different process where it's, the, where it's progressive, and then it starts dying, and then it dies. But the trouble is, if capitalism dies without socialism, you won't have no life on this earth. So that's the problem. All right, next. I sometimes question whether the system we have now is capitalism. It's capitalism not. is based on competition. 
you know, if you look at the different industries, the financial, energy, retail, and all that. Pharma. Yeah, I mean, the, the cost of entry is prohibitively high and kind of restricted to people who have book of money, you know, you know yeah. right, 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 right now. I think what you're seeing right now, and it started with, with uh, Reagan and before that, the Powell, you know, doctrine that you, that you saw, you know, a deterioration of, uh, of workers' rights right now. Uh, I think Tom Hartman brought up uh, the fact uh, in his show last week. We don't support unions, you know, legally, like they do. So what? You know, by your, their what's European. What's your question? What's your question? My we my question is, later. you know, what is the mechanism that that uh, workers can use to regain, you know, the, the kind of uh, legal rights that they had in the '40s, in the '50s, and the '60s? Well, and, and in which we had the greatest, you know, degree of prosperity. What what uh, what the one percenters don't get is that we are a consumer society, you know. So in yeah, a way, that's, I think that's enough. I think yeah, yeah. because you're making you want to comment on it. Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, for one thing, if we look back at history, we can understand what happened yeah. right after the Civil War. You had monopolies come into being. What happens is you have, uh, let's say, a shoe factory on one corner, another shoe factory opens up on the other and says, I'm going to outsell him by lowering the prices of my uh, shoes. So he does that and puts, and puts the other people out of business, but takes over his business, and eventually what you get is monopolies. Mm -hmm. And from monopolies, you get wars, because these monopolies have to have tons of raw materials, they have to have very big markets, and they have to have cheap labor. So there's competition amongst them, and eventually some of them went out. Like in the United States, you have three people. You have Jeff Bezos, and you have uh, Warren Buffett, and uh, Gates, Bill Gates. And those three people have as much wealth as half the population of the United States. So you have a top-heavy society. And anything that's top heavy is going to fall after a while. He can't be doing that. And the, the average worker, the minimum wage, I think, is seven thirty-five, and they want fifteen dollars now. Even that is not enough. It should be about twenty-five dollars. So people are starting to wake up. And when Bernie Sanders uh, talks about uh, a social democracy, people are beginning to look into socialism to a certain degree. It's a, it's very small right now. But eventually it'll grow because the system is so top heavy that you're going to have a depression that will make 1929 look like a tea party, what's going on. Because you have 40% of the workers stop looking for work. That's about 100 million people. So you're going to have a depression. Nothing is there like any way? Can, can we put a stop to it politically? Uh, you have to have people organized. That's the only way. And go into socialism. Huh. Uh, you, you said the state is there to protect the ruling class, but the state is also to protect the general population. It's protecting you and me right now. The state is protecting us. Don't you, is it, don't you agree? Well, I had a, a friend that became a cop. You know what they told him when we went into the, the cop school? They told him, don't hang around with people that are not going anywhere. And if somebody calls them up, a cop calls them up, there's a little, the little amount of, of junk on my front lawn, and I live on Lakeshore Drive. They'll run over right away and take care of it. If somebody calls up, a poor person says, I was just robbed, or uh, somebody broke into my house, they take their time. They don't care too much. The, 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 their main, their, main, uh, their main, uh, main function is to protect the ruling class. It's always been like that under slavery, or under feudalism. It's always been like that. John That's what the purpose of the state is. The, uh, the, the general population. Yeah, but not really. They have to say we serve and protect, but it doesn't mean anything. You have to look at what they do, not what they say. 
What they do is what counts, not what they say. It doesn't mean anything. Charlie, when you get a chance, yeah, see it in China in the in the fifties after the revolution came, they arrested all the landlords and rich people and put them in and they took them in the park, made them wear big signs that said like, "I'm a crook." Yeah. Do you think we should? That we're going to achieve something like that in the United States? Well, every country has its own history, its own um, background, and so forth. So it'll depend on the country itself what type of socialism they have. In the United States, most probably it'll be a, a two-party system instead of a one-party system. Do you think the police and so, should some save other countries may be more parties? I don't know. Will the police save the rich people? Huh? From will the Will the police here save the rich people? Um, eventually, what happens in revolutions is the army goes to the other side. That's what happened in Russia, and that's what happened in China. And in, the, in Cuba, what happened, the uh, guerrillas started fighting them, and the guerrillas went to Mexico in order to train, and they had a general that taught all of them shot shooting. So as soon as a few uh, Batista's army got killed, they ran away. They were scared and they ran away. Yeah. They didn't have the will to fight. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think I have a question. Uh, the, so you're saying that um, the current situation now, say in Venezuela, or that um, they might, maybe we're trying to create a, to support this new guy. Bide. Maduro. But, what's his name? No, Guido or something. Guido. Guido. Yeah, Guido. Yeah. Yeah. Guido. Yeah. Guido. Yeah. Yeah. And, but yet, um, so you've got us, the mercenaries, uh, or the New World Order, whatever, supporting these guys, and and then Maduro's trying to prevail. What, what's your take on that? What, well, well, for one thing, this guy, whatever his name, never ran for office. <coughs> And when somebody did run from office from the other party, they only got about 20%. And what this guy done that you're talking Guido. about, Guido, he went to an army base and tried to get the officers to go against Maduro. Nobody came out. They didn't pay no attention to him. And if you look at the pictures of the people that don't like uh, Maduro, they're all white. And they all are clothes very good. Uh, very decently. And uh, Venezuela is about half African American, and you don't see one African American there. Yeah. And another thing, uh, Maduro is giving people food every so often, and he's given to them for free. So you're not going to revolt against them, but the United States wants the oil there. That's what it's happening. Is, is there any way to stop the United States from intervening or interfering? Well, well, you had volunteers in Africa that um, I think it was in Angola, uh, like, this, like the Cubans, sent volunteers into Angola, and the volunteers were all black people, and they all came from Africa. Their, uh, their ancestors came from Africa, and they're the ones that beat the South African Party uh, Army, and, and so they won the war in Angola. Yeah. Sid, um, going back in his, I don't know how far your talk went back in history, but going back, I think of the Egyptians with their pharaohs, and I think of the Chinese with their emperors, and the Babylonians with their kings. Have people just naturally organized into higher and lower? Do what? Do people just naturally organize? into like rulers and non-rulers? Yeah. The, that's uh, the way we fall well, out? Um, let's see, I think you're talking about feudalism? Yeah. Yeah, well, the aristocracy in the order of the manor were the ruling classes. My question is, is that the way people have always organized? Because as I, my memory goes back in history, I go to the Egyptians with their pharaohs, the Babylonians yeah, okay. with their king. Yeah, I understand. Is that the way human nature organizes? Yeah, it's certain. Um, Junctures in history, that's the way they organize. It doesn't come from their will or anything. It comes to their level of, um, of production. If they have a real low level of production, they can't go into capitalism. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't have the 
productive capacity. That's all they had was guilds. That's not my question. My question is, do people, as a fundamental organize them, self-organize into like a higher and lower? Because no, when I a, go back into no. history, back to the Egyptians, no, they don't back to organize the Babylonians. Into what, they automatically develop into it, just like a child develops into a man. It's the same thing. So they, human, it's automatic. Human nature automatically it's strat not human nature. stratifies. It's not human nature. It's, it's the productive level that won't support a society that's higher. It just doesn't support it. That's the way they have to go. It's an automatic thing. It's not something that's organized. They don't do it because of their will. They do, do it because it's there. I mean, isn't there, is there a non-capitalist world example, like before capitalism, where people just cooperate communally or um, without yeah, that? Yeah, but before civilization, you had primitive society, and they didn't have no uh, uh, consciousness about uh, ruling classes or anything like that. Like, for instance, the American Indians was researched by uh, Lewis Henry Morgan who was a social anthropologist about uh, in the 18, late 1800s or so. And he went to New York State and he, uh, and, he, and he dug into their type of society. There's a book called Asian Society. He wrote that and says how they were organized and everything. But they didn't have no idea of uh, private ownership. It was completely foreign. Everything was held in common. They didn't know anything about classes or anything like that. Because they didn't have anything like that. So they could just cooperate. Yeah, they just cooperate. Just cooperative yeah. environment. Otherwise, if they didn't cooperate, they would have died. Because early humans were very primitive, and it's all, they were hunters and gatherers, and they, that's as far as they went. So they couldn't have a productive society under that. So slavery developed eventually, where you had more production it was good in one sense, bad in another. Do you know who brought slavery here or to America? Well, good, four well, questions. Mm -hmm. Well, slavery, for instance, Patrick Henry, he says, give me liberty or give me death. He was the biggest slave owner in America. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Do you want to ask? Yeah. Doesn't, somebody else say Doesn't the Constitution protect us against the police state? You gotta no. say yes. No, you said does. Look what's happening Two now process. under Trump. Huh? Look what's happening under Trump. He didn't commit a crime. He, he's doing whatever he wants. To do. That's you liberals saying that. I say no. We encourage. We don't agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, what you're facts you're reading. Yeah, you're who your sources are. Do you have questions? Uh, we're looking for a transfer of wealth. So poor people, you know, from rich to poor. Huh? Would there be a better system? Since we have all the tools in place now, to go through a. Uh, uh, a stock buy, uh, a buy, stock ownership with the workers? No, actually it's better if everybody strives for a better life by working together towards a better life instead of competing against one another and having a few people on the top that have everything and the bottom having nothing. It's a, You can't do it through stocks and bonds or anything. That's a form of capitalism and capitalism is dying, let's face it. <laughs> well, look what's happening. If you, if you look at the uh, news every day, this one is killing that one, this one is killing that one. The killings every day. People are so, uh, you would say, insecure now that they do anything that comes into their mind. They, they hate people because they're blaming other people for being insecure. It's a very insecure society. We're in seven wars at this time, and we're probably in more. They want to get into war in Iran. They want to get into war in Venezuela. You have wars, 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 and that could touch off an atomic holocaust. It's very dangerous. We have to get rid of capitalism. Like, like Mark said, throw it in the dustpan of history where it belongs. Just like that happened to communism, and you're in Russia. Well, under communism, people make mistakes, and that's how we progress. We didn't make mistakes, we couldn't solve the yeah. problems. How do you explain then these, the, the Eastern Europe in the early 90s with the widespread adoption of capitalism? Yeah, well, 
What happened was they made tremendous mistakes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Not only that, the United States had something like 250 bases surrounding the Soviet Union. Every day of the week they were trying to overthrow them. That's yes. why they had such repression. <coughs> Do you have a question? Uh -huh. So, uh, aside from the uh, claim that it was only because of outside repression uh, that the Soviet state or the Chinese state were repressive internally after they'd had their communist revolutions. Yeah. Uh, among many criticisms I could make or ask about, what about the fact that they had a cordon sanitaire of communism from East Germany all the way to the Pacific, yeah. and you still had the Sino-Soviet split. Yeah. You had two adamantly, yeah, you know, right, anti-American yeah. and anti-capitalist yeah. superpowers well, who had most of Eurasia under their control. Yeah, you're right. I want to hear Sid Cohn on this subject. Okay, for one thing, un under Napoleon, Napoleon invaded Russia. And when Napoleon invaded Russia, what the Russians have done is destroy everything in Napoleon's path. He couldn't get no food, he couldn't get no clothes, couldn't get anything. The Soviet Union used the same tactics. It, uh, it, it burned down everything that the, that the Nazis could use, and that's one of the reasons that uh, it, uh, it, it defeated uh, uh, <coughs> Nazi Germany. Another thing, in, in, uh, there's always mistakes being made by everybody. But the mistakes aren't just mistakes. Mistakes are to be used to advance society. So if you have a mistake, you try to figure out what is the mistake that we're making. And in the Soviet Union, they tried to industrialize at a very fast pace, which was good, but at the same time, they didn't give them, the people any uh, uh, consumer goods, and housing was very inferior there. And that's one of the reasons when Gorbachev came to power, he was able to win and say, oh, we're going to bring in capitalism. That'll solve the whole problem. But if you look at it now, the people in the Soviet Union realize that capitalism is even worse than what they had before. So they're, in China, they realize that. And what they've done, they industrialize by using capitalism itself in order to industrialize to get to the certain point that socialism needs in order to satisfy the basic needs of people. Once you satisfy the basic needs of people, then you can go into socialism. But China still doesn't have socialism. It's, it's moving in that direction and making tremendous progress. So I think they'll solve the problem. They didn't solve the problem yet, but they'll solve it. Eventually, if you take the airplane or you take uh, the, uh, if you take ships with uh, was it with a with an engine, they 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 make so many mistakes in doing that. Eventually, they come they come to have sailboats and uh, motors and boats, and in the plane we're able to go uh, use rockets to go to the moon and things like that. So you learn from mistakes. That's how you progress. Mistakes are very normal. Everybody makes mistakes. But the thing is, not to let the mistakes stay where they were, but use them to overcome the problem. But just to follow up, though, but I don't think I quite got to. I'm out saying Chung and his cohort could not get along with Khrushchev and Brezhnev. And yeah, there was an inner fight. There was an inner fight. Like uh, under Marx, Marx said, uh, socialism will first come in industrialized states because industrialized states have the wherewithal to uh, have the necessities of life for people. Russia never had that. It was the most backward country in all of Europe. And uh, Stalin had the five-year plans, but he didn't take care of the people there. That's why uh, capitalism came back. In, in China, and I got this not from China, from the BBC, the BBC said, BBC said that the increase in wages in, in China is a hundred dollars a year. So they're making tremendous progress and eventually they're going to go into socialism. When the Chinese ambassador was here, that's what he was talking about. That they have a lot of hurdles to overcome, but they're trying to overcome it at this point 
and go into socialism. Uh, when we say capitalism, freedom, and democracy, what we're talking about, when this country was founded, the only ones that could vote were white people with property. It was bourgeois democracy, not, not democracy for everybody. And any democracy you ever got was fought for, like the women's vote or the black vote. Everything was fought for. The eight-hour day, better conditions on the job. Capitalism doesn't give you these things. You have to fight for them. Back there, Which philosophical theory does State do you favor most? Like uh, Hume or Hobbes or Locke, John Locke? Are you familiar with those? Which oh, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't hear what you said. Which, philosoph Which philosophical theory of the State do you favor? Hobbes, Locke, Hume? I'll tell you the truth. I never, I never read any of them. So I can't tell you. Yeah. What I know is capitalism is, fa is failing at a rapid rate. If we keep going like there are, there won't be no human life on this planet. You've read Marx, though, right? Marx. Yeah, Marx, Lenin, uh, his, uh, his uh, son-in-law, Paul Lafarge. I read a whole bunch of things. I get the monthly review. I, I read uh, Hegel and things like that and dialectical materialism. I use dialectical materialism in my own life and it works like crazy. What exactly is dialectical materialism? Huh? How do you define what is, what is dialectical it? materialism? Well, it's, mm -hmm. it's contradictions. Everything is contradiction. And overcoming the contradiction is when you get progress. So there's always, freedom is not inherent in the human being. It's what we struggle for. Freedom is always a struggle. It's never something that is given to you. Any freedom we ever got in life, even before, uh, even during primitive society, was fought for. There's no other way to get it but to fighting for it. We hope that we won't have to fight a war for it, and capitalism will just disappear. But who knows? You never know what's going to happen. You can't foretell the future. You, you, could, you could see the direction the future is going, but you never foretell it 100%. There's too much uh, different forces coming into being. Charlie? Yes, it, uh, we had the bailout of 2008, and before that, there were about a dozen recessions and depressions. And almost every company fails. 90, more than 90, was it 90 some percent of them fail within a couple of years? None of them make 100 years. And yet, some people actually maintain that capitalism is successful. When there's, and they can't pay a living wage to the employees, which to me doesn't indicate you've got a company or an operation that's successful if it can't pay the people to work there. Well, the living wage. And yet, I hear all the time from some political parties that the capitalists, all oh, capitalism is working and they condemn anything else and they say it's working. I, I don't understand where, what's the working part. I think part? what people do are they, are are they very, just lying people, to themselves? I think people are very subjective. What they go by is their own progress or their own way of life. If that's successful, they, they more or less project that into the outside world. Well, if I'm successful, anybody could be successful. But some of them were brought up different. Some have uh, parents that had very good income, no they had good educations, and some people were brought up, like, let's say, in the ghetto or someplace, they didn't have nothing. But there's no percentage evidence, factual data that indicates that capitalism is successful. It's, it's a success. <laughs> well, it was successful up to a certain point. Where? It, well, for instance, all the things we have here, like cars and everything. Well, you cannot say sure. that's not success, how many but, but it's destroying faster than it's building. Wait, wait, I don't want to go on. You have one car company that succeeds, 
and there are 50 or at least 100 yeah. in the United States which don't exist, and the people were unemployed, I, I and think the, the investors lost their money. Yeah. That it's, six is old, and we got cars. It's monopoly. What kind of system is that? It goes toward monopoly power, yeah. right? And that should have been balanced by the antitrust that, legislation. That, so we got cars? Standard of right. Concentration okay. happens. Okay. It was better than what preceded Constitution. And you had free enterprise. You create things. You had actually, individual yeah. and ideas that actually competition. You've got to give that freedom to do that. Competition is the thing of the past. No, it's not. It is, it is. I'll tell you why. You have conglomerates now. Yeah. Conglomerates, you never had that before, where one industry could control another industry. And you have three people, like I said, that have half the wealth of the United States. That's not success. Capitalism works. Capitalism works. Not for everybody, it's just yeah, well, some, pe some people it helps, yeah. but the vast majority it harms. That's the coal miner. Right. A lot of people have mental diseases, and they have all kinds of diseases because they put uh, different uh, chemicals in your food. They put uh, different yeah. things in the water, different things into animals and so forth, and a lot of it's causing cancer. Yeah. You have so much yeah, cancer business. in the United States. It's an epidemic. One out of three people have cancer. In the they don't care. They'll kill you. Mm. That's a long statistic. One out of three people mm -hmm. got cancer? That's not. Oh. Well, uh, there, here's a new person. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Sid, yeah, you, you talked about uh, the difference in the revolutionary movement between the Marxists who uh, wanted uh, the state to continue at least for a while and the anarchists who wanted to get rid of it yeah. uh, at the same time that they yeah. abolish uh, capitalism. Right. Uh, uh, what what what, uh, what do you think is wrong with the uh, anarchists' uh, approach? Or? Like uh, Noam, Ch Noam Chomsky, very intelligent man, wrote a lot of interesting books, but he thinks that the once capitalism overthrown, the workers themselves could take over completely and do away with the state. I think it's utopian because the workers themselves has to learn from actually running the government in order to have socialism and communism. They have to do it themselves, and they don't automatically learn that. They have to practice it, what they call praxis. In other words, you have to do something in order to gain knowledge. If you don't do anything, you're not going to gain no knowledge. But if you say the state is a repressive organ, yeah, right. uh, what, what benefit is there from uh, working people operating that apparatus. Well, some of them become cops, and there's uh, some of them um, join the army because they can't get um, they can't get jobs. But eventually, he might become cannon fodder, and he might be killed. So, is, uh, capitalism it brings progress to uh, people that are working for it, the funkies, and the and the people that are working for it, like the politicians. Most politicians are just social climbers. That's all they are. So, and they and they have a good life because they, they belong. Uh, they're owned by the capitalist class, and the capitalist class gives them uh, good, real good benefits. Like for instance, uh, Obama. Some people thought, oh, he's black. He'll be progressive. Yeah, but it's also was very uh, bourgeois at the same time. He, he was a he was a social climber. That's what he really was. And he done nothing more than uh, than Clinton or other Democrats going the third way, as they call it. The third way was uh, actually going toward a reactionary way, and Obama was just as reactionary as Clinton. Uh, yeah, here first, then. So, from what you just said, it brought to mind. I had another question earlier, but is there? A way to achieve utopia with that. To achieve utopia, do you do we have to eliminate the social class climbers from among us? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the social class climbers, they're parasites. They live off the labor of the workers. Capitalists live off the labor of the workers. They're, they're parasites. It's a form of slavery. 
what do you what do you need slavery for? When everybody could just be doing something that runs the society. What what's the test or mechanism for eliminating social climbers? Well, we have to go into a different type of social system where everybody gets the benefit and not just social climbers. <coughs> Are you worried about this? Yeah, here. Um, social climbers, question aside. Uh, Michael, I believe, had asked about this. That's your name, right? But, but about Marxism versus anarchism. Uh, within the last century of the communist tradition, if I could get your comment, please, on three um, broad uh, critiques or dissents from Stalinism. Uh, the Trotskyist movement that I guess wanted to yeah. push for more radical, immediate social change and fight against the Soviet state and bureaucracy that was getting built up. No, on I'm the there, other um, hand, Bukharin, who wanted to slow down the economic changes. Bukharin. And then up to the 70s and 80s, the Euro-communist movement, where they were kind of retreating yeah. from yeah, the communist right, revolution. Yeah. So, Mr. Cohn, please. Okay, what, what it is, under Stalinism, what they've done is the party dictatorship of the, uh, of, of, of the bureaucrats to a large degree. And after a while, the bureaucrats just took over the state and ran it for themselves, and, and, uh, and you went back to capitalism. They made tremendous mistakes, but you can't just blame it on them. You have to blame it also on the capitalist powers. Like I said, the United States too had 250 bases surrounding the Soviet Union. There wasn't a day that went by that they didn't try to over, overthrow the Soviet Union. That's why they had such repression. So you're... What, did you say Bucher, your argument about Bukharin versus West... Oh, yeah, Bukharin and then the, the, oh, yeah. the European well, parties at the well, end of the Cold War. Yeah, well, under Bukharin, he, he wanted um, anarchy, but uh, not anarchy where people just do whatever they want. He, he wanted a philosophical form of anarchy, where the state was run by workers entirely. And the workers took over. But you can't do that if they're not educated to do that. How are you going to get somebody that doesn't even know how to read or write? And the majority in the Soviet Union, in Russia, couldn't even read and write. How are they going to take over the state and run it? It's impossible. You, they have to train themselves to do that, and that takes time. You can't do it right away. Euro-communism was nothing more than going back to capitalism because they thought socialism has failed and we have to go back to capitalism. And that's the end of history, like Fukuyama said. That's the end of history. It's not the end of history. There is no end to history as long as human beings live on the planet. It's ridiculous. It's all I've done was make mistakes. And you know, but you can overcome mistakes. You have to learn from mistakes. Freedom is not something that you're born with, but something that you fight for and you struggle for. It's not something that's given to you. Can I, did you clarify about Trotsky and West European? Well, Trotsky, I, had a, I used to have conversations with Trotsky. You know what they said? Every little thing there, there was a, a problem could have been a revolutionary problem. But so it, it takes maybe 500 years or so to have a revolution. They wanted any mistake to turn into a revolution. It, they were out of touch with reality to a large degree. Like Trotsky wanted a revolution all of Europe, but all of Europe wasn't ready for it. For instance, in Germany, which is the most industrialized country in Europe, the Spartacus Party, or the Communist Party at that time, under Rosen Luxemburg, and there's another, I forget the, the other guy's name. Liebknecht. Yeah, Liebknecht tried to have socialism there, but the state was too strong. They overcame him because the, the, uh, the uh, situation was not right for socialism, and they couldn't have it in that state. Capitalists are far too strong. Well, in the United States, we can start a business. We can be mini capitalists. That's happened yeah, all yeah. across the United States. Yeah. Capitalism is good and it's uh, 
good for the country. You shine. I think you're living in the world of 1900, <laughs> when the monopolies came. <laughs> the monopolies. Oh, my father had a restaurant. I, I, yeah, my but got you, a restaurant. You go down any street <laughs> in, in Chicago, and you find so many empty the stores. Monopolies. There's no, there's, there's no such thing as, as free enterprise. Free enterprise went out with monopolies. Monopolies came in and they drove them all out. There's no free enterprise. You, you're talking about the early 1900s. You're talking about the end of the Civil War that we had when monopolies start coming in power on the railroads. That's the beginning of monopolies in the United States. Charlie? Yeah, yeah there's one guy keep telling me that all taxation this step. So if you take money from the one percent or the corporations, they 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 can't be. They, otherwise, they're job creators, and you shouldn't be taxing them. Well, you know what happens when these corporations get real big. What happens is they lay off people like crazy, and they try to make the other people work longer for less money. And that's what's happening now. You have about 40% of the workers that can't, can't get jobs, so start looking, stop looking for jobs. That's about one third of the population of the United States. They stop looking. So they tell you 3.5% or 4%, but they only count people that look for work, not people to stop looking for. I want to say, I've heard today that 40% of seniors now are retiring with no savings. Right, that's a new statistic yeah. that's coming. Yeah, we can't. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, you, you want a, a circle okay, back around? Let's it. go. Oh yeah, you haven't asked one. Mm -hmm. We probably should move on. But yeah, you want to ask one? Any of these people? Yeah, no, go ahead. You haven't asked one. Did any of these people take a course on the correct way to lean against the desk? Well, I can't hear you. Did any people take a course on the correct way to lean against the desk? On the correct way to lead the country. Lean against a desk. Well, it's a more elusive skill. I understand some people left the country. I don't know how many, but I heard on the radio one of these talk shows. This guy calls up. He country. says, I'm, "I'm leaving the United States and going to live in Mexico in small some small town, and I won't have to suffer what's going to happen in the United States." But I don't know how many people. Capitalism is a success. Yeah. Um, no, no retirees. There's a small country like North Korea. From everything I hear about North Korea, it's, it's to paraphrase, a feudal state. There's a leader, a military, and poor people. China and the Soviet Union, and Russia, excuse me, and Russia are great supporters of this inhuman uncommunist state. Yeah. Why, it, it seems like an easy thing for those superpowers to just turn North Korea into a communist state. Right. What's missing? Well, for one thing, there's a book you could get okay. called The Hidden History of the Korean War by I.F. Stone. And he was talking a few days before the war started, or a week before it started. What happened was, you had the, the Dulles brothers, one was, I think it was Alan Dulles, he was on the border, on the, on the DMZ border, right before the war started with a number of generals. Before that, you had skirmishes between North Korea and South Korea, but it never developed into a war. Then, about a week after these people were on the border, the war started. Well, that's not my States, question. That's huh? not my question. My question isn't about the North South. My question is North Korea is a very small place. Why don't the superpowers of China and Russia turn it into a communist state? Those people deserve a better life. Right now, in 2020, why don't they just turn it into well, a communist a, state? That's okay. what I was trying to get to. All right. The United States started the war and destroyed North Korea to such a point, you could look for miles and miles, not one building was standing. They destroyed the whole country. And, and, and what they've done, 
is not is rebuilt after the war, and now to rebuild itself, but it takes time. They don't have the uh, let's say the the land for agriculture to bring people up, but. They were going pretty good before the war. There's a, there, there's a scholar from the University of Chicago. I, think, I can't think of his name, but I heard him a number of times. And he said North Korea was doing pretty good before the Korean War started. Everybody had enough to eat. Everybody was living in fair housing. And they had uh, 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 health care and things that had along that nature until the United States destroyed it. If you look at the United States, the United States has been an imperialist power, and that is a modern imperialist power, since the Spanish-American War, where it took over the Dominican Republic, took over Haiti, took over um, Hawaii and the Philippines. The United States, anytime people want to have their own life, the United States won't leave, leave it alone because it has markets there, it gets raw materials from those places, and it has cheap labor from those places. The United States has been an empire for well over a hundred years, a modern empire. Before that, it was still an empire, but in the old sense. And the old sense was they got taxes from people and they got tribute from people, let's say like uh, wheat or uh, milk or something like that. The United States has always been an imperialist power. Let's go to rebuttals if we can. We've had a long, extended question okay. period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sid, if you're ready for your yeah. rebuttals, okay. how many people want to rebut? We'll probably got enough time that everybody gets five minutes. Uh, get ready to go because. All right. Let's thank our speakers. Yeah. 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 All right, let's uh, let's uh, give our all right. Chicken. Call. I'd like to call the college back to order, please. Okay. Capitalism, the great success. All right, let's uh, get back to it, and we'll get you five minutes on the clock. Well, I looked up what famous people in history thought about the state like uh, Karl Marx, argued that there are essentially three stages of human history, feudalism, capitalism, and finally communism. All three are born out of class struggles. In each phase, one, place, one class dominates and is in conflict with, the another, with, with another. It is these conflicts which determine the social and economic structures of that society. And then there's uh, Vladimir Lenin suggested that the Marxist dream of the withering state, the withering away of the state was much further down the revolutionary road than Marxists imagined. He argued that a strong state would be needed for a considerable time in order to enforce proletarian democracy. Lenin called this the dictatorship of the pro proletarian. Adam Smith liken the consequences of a free market to an in, invisible hand which places the equilibrium value upon goods and labor. Smith's ideal of the free market led him to a minimalist view of the role of the state. I'm just telling you what these different philosophers thought about uh, the state. Okay, so uh, Carl Schmitt, he was like, uh, he was a German economist. He associated, associated with Hitler. For, for Schmidt, that the sovereign is he who, de who decides the exception, i.e., the point at which the state overrides the constraints of the law by which it is normally bound. Ideals of equality just, and justice will always be subservient to this fact and will therefore never be fully realized. The way they're saying that the ideals of, uh, of equality and justice, and that's what happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, Hitler just overruled everything and just took control. Sigmund Freud argued that all societies progress through the sublimation, the, the sublimation of an instinctual desire. For Freud, the re repression or control of instinctual desire is, is civilization. A lot of people don't believe that anymore, but I'm just giving you his, his point of view. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> all right, next. All right. 
I guess I'm next. Uh, Sid, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, I did agree with some of it. I do want, I'm not going to go back to uh, guns, germs, and steel. I would suggest that it would take me more than five minutes to complete what I wanted to say on that. But I would suggest that if you've read the book, Go back and read the chapter, I think it's chapter 14, on kleptocracies. He did not say the United States was an exception. Read that carefully. I did, and I'm going to read it again. Uh, I do want to say something. I'm not, I'm not pushing capitalism, okay? I myself am a small s socialist. I think capitalism is full of crap. We ought to get rid of it in time yeah. through democracy and freedom. Yes. Okay, but all the art Nordic countries, Canada and New Zealand, are capitalistic countries. I do not see huge numbers of people coming here from Norway, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and Iceland, they're not coming here. They're not coming here from New Zealand, and not that many are coming here from Canada, although there's no guards hardly on that border except the Americans who want to keep, seem to keep the Americans out. I did hear there were some people going back from the United States to uh, Canada. I can't say how many, or I don't have proof of that, but all of those countries are capitalistic countries. But they're all controlled capitalistic countries. They're, their countries are strong, and their governments are strong, and they believe, as far as I can tell, in regulation. So if you have things that disagree with that, I would be interested in, hear, in, in hearing them, but right now, let me tell you, I don't see those people coming here from Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and uh, Canada, and, and uh, New Zealand. Thank you. Yeah. 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 lowering of the tax rates. Reforms you see uh, what's on my head? <laughs> Make America sane again. <laughs> Vote libertarian. Just now you can get energy. this in any number of, look on the internet. You can get it, they're cheap. Uh, this one costs a little bit more, it's white, for whatever reason. Uh, all I can say is, hey, this rings true to me. What's going on now is crazy. So how do we deal with it? So uh, a friend of mine said, hey, uh, why are you so angry with Mr. Trump? And I said, I'm not really angry with him, but he should not be president. I guess my, my big problem is with him, he's unbalanced. And sooner or later, this whole thing's going to come crashing down on us. And Mr. Trump's going to leave office and do whatever he does. Uh, we need to bring the balance back mm -hmm. right. and sanity too. Yeah. Twenty four ninety nine on Amazon, free prime shipping. Yeah. What's that? Twenty four ninety nine on Amazon is your hat. Free two day shipping with Prime. Uh, Twenty nine ninety five. <laughs> Twenty four ninety nine on Amazon. I need three things: sour pickles. Okay. And my, uh, Go ahead. Okay. And I want a piece of strawberry shortcake in the box. <laughs> okay, well, I'll get it. I'm doing okay. money right now. So. Okay. I agree with the comments uh, of the previous speaker, but um, but uh, but uh, Trump is only part of the part of the problem. Trump really doesn't run anything. You know, <laughs> right? Right? You know. Yeah. But I'm afraid that the trends that we see now are really a result of trends that 
go back to the 1970s. You know, we're beginning with the Powell, you know, doctrine before Powell became uh, a Supreme Court justice, in which he he warned, um, you know, major uh, capitalists that you have to get hold, you know, of uh, the message. Think tanks, you know, like the American Enterprise, you know, Institute. The Heritage Foundation, the Koch brothers, they have spent an inordinate amount of money changing the terms of the debate. And not necessarily for the better, you know, for this for this country. In fact, on my way, you know, in Washington DC where we met with fellow progressives on on how to push a more progressive agenda. I came across a labor organizer, you know, for, you know, Lyft, you know, and Uber drivers. Talk about, you know, extreme libertarianism gone crazy. This is this is the world that the one percenters want to create for us. And to that I say, absolutely not. A gig economy, what is developing right now is a gig economy. An economy in which there's no such thing as a social safety net. There's no such thing, you know, as pension. You just go and just work at will. The employer can do whatever they can with you. This is about the worst that I have ever seen it in, in probably the last 40 years, you know, right now. There is an imbalance in the political system right now. Organized labor doesn't have the kind of political clout it once had. And, 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 and you can start with somebody like Reagan who actually made it worse. He destroyed the ability of organized labor to organize workers. The irony of all of this is that we are living now in a consumer society. What the one percenters are doing is killing the goose that laid the, you know, the golden egg. We are the job creators. We created wealth in this. Country. The problem is. You know, even though we are the most productive, you know, uh, workers, you know, society has ever known, we're not benefited from, from it. All, all the technological, you know, um, innovations that have made, you know, industries more productive. Well, workers are not are are not the beneficiaries of it, and that's the real problem right now. Yeah. We somehow have to find a way, and I would say Trump is really the worst of the worst. He makes Richard Nixon look like child's play. He just makes the rules as they go along. And that is what makes him so dangerous. You've got an unstable man right now who has the lovers of government in his hands. And it's time for us to take it back. There's so much to say on so much to say on this subject. Uh, one thing is I think that the, the, the term state state is a European construct. Um, I think the people in the Middle East are organized, self-organized into tribes. I think organizing them at the state is just something the Europeans did to them. And that, uh, um, unfortunately, I can't see a way of organizing people into anything but this European construct, which is state. The other thing about why I brought up North Korea is North Korea is such a tiny place. And the fact that China, a very successful country, cannot 
find the wherewithal to bring it into the communist world is like, ah, wow, that just doesn't make sense. That 60 years has gone by since the end of the war. And in those same 60 years, China, a much bigger place, has grown incredibly. And they couldn't bring North Korea up with them. Um, and these are the friends of North Korea. Now, the other thing to say about the United States, the line I like best from, the, from our early history is the one that says, to form a more perfect union. Nothing's perfect, just more perfect. The thing about America that I come to understand, or not America, but the United States, is that everybody thinks the United States is built on growth. And I don't think so. I think the United States is built on change. And the difference is that you can change forever, but you can't grow forever. You know? And for some reason, it's like if the United States went back to horse and buggies, we would just go back to horse and buggies, whatever works. You know? But the rest of the world thinks it's growth. And I laugh at the Japanese because the Japanese think it's growth. And I'm sure there's a company somewhere in Japan that's still trying to perfect the Walkman because they're in a growth mode. And you simply can't grow forever. You know, but you can change forever. And that's something that we do towards a more perfect union. Like Sid said, adding first we had the, the bourgeois democracy. And then we added, you know, the African-American men. And then we had got away into, from property holders and added men in general, and then the African-American, and then the women. And it just is change. That's all it is. And the thing about the state, I'll be back. I think the state is, like I said, it's just a European construct. The things that the Europeans do, the things that we, most of us here do, is we simply put things into boxes. We take a thought and put it into a box. And it's just something we're good at. And we created the term, the concept of state. And we're trying to fit everybody into that box. And they don't belong there. And probably because they're different kinds of people. You know, the people in the Middle East are not, shouldn't be organized into states. And probably the last thing that I can remember to say, if I can remember it at all, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the last thing was also, was a wonderful thought, but it's, it's, it's thank you, bye. Um, I think that two of the greatest people in, the, in history is uh, Marx and Lenin, and uh, they both had a really a huge impact on my life. I've uh, spent countless hours uh, enjoying watching Groucho Marx movies, <laughs> and, uh, and John Lennon is really one of my top uh, musical artists and, and songwriters. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, levity aside, uh, on a more serious note, it seems to me that there is a tendency when people debate to uh, uh, look at, to focus on all the good sides of their arguments and all the bad sides of the opposition's argument and then vice versa, and uh, it, it's certainly easy to pick sorry, out the flaws sorry, of uh, communism and the, the flaws of capitalism, of pure, pure capitalism. Um, <clears throat> a couple of examples that I love to give, I, I, I'm, I imagine people have heard this story before, that there was, there was a point in uh, uh, China's history where Mao uh, just arbitrarily said this is going to be the production uh, for this coming year and, and the steel production, the only way they could make steel production was they sent out their the minions 
and literally we're collecting metal from the population, the pots and the pans to to make steel. That was their source for for metal to make steel, and China literally had a negative GNP, um, and it was just just literally murdering millions of people in the country. So. Um, uh, yeah, communism has made mistakes is an understatement. Um, but for capitalism, one of my favorite examples is, um, uh, I, I believe it's hepatitis C. There is actually a drug that can cure you of hepatitis C. And do, does everybody, is there anybody yes. here that knows that? Yeah. No. So, so what happened is that they were making this drug and then the company came along, some investors said, wait a second. We should buy this. We'll just, it doesn't matter what it costs. Because when people are going to die, they'll pay anything. So, you know how much that drug is now, the, the drug treatment protocol? $100,000. And before it was affordable, and now they want, they want their money. You want to live? $100,000. And the irony is the insurance companies won't, won't pay that money because hepatitis C doesn't kill you. It's the, it's the liver, your liver failing that'll kill you down the road, but the, the insurance companies, they won't even pay for it. So, so there's the wonders of pure capitalism, right? It's like absolutely no thought to people. It's just all about dollars. It's, it's heartbreaking if you have a heart. And, um, and it makes me think of a, a, a comment that I actually uh, disagree with, with Sid. Sid compared capitalism to really just like slavery, and I just think that that's a bad term. It, it really, be, because slavery is where you own somebody, and people aren't owned under this system. It's more like indentured servitude. Oh, that's nice. So it's like, we're not going to own you. We're just going to bleed you from as much as we can. But we don't own you. And that's, it, it reminds me of, uh, of a thousand years ago in Europe. You had all these tiny countries with all these kings, except the difference now is there aren't, there aren't boundaries. Uh, there are geographic boundaries. There are these economic boundaries where everything is sliced up for different corporations, different parts of the economy, the economy and the market. It, it, pure capitalism is just going to be the death of us. And it's going to create a huge, huge social uprising down the road if you have more and more people, less and less people, with all the cash. And people need to organize. So that I, I think social democracy is a great way to go. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in the days of the ancient Egyptians, the people built pyramids and great structures like the Sphinx and so forth. And they weren't compelled to do this out of slavery, but they found out, they used to think that they were slaves, but they found out that the people that did the building did this out of love for Pharaoh. Uh. <laughs> and so the thing is, if you look at most any new government, the people are often fanatically dedicated to that new government. Now, if we look at the United States of America, uh, the, um, the people were uh, dedicated to that, and uh, our government held that there would be no monopolies. Hello? Our government held that there would be no monopolies, and so we didn't have monopolies until that the government uh, interfered and put in monopolies uh, when they established the railroads. And so the railroads were, I think, basically the first monopolies in the United States of America. Uh, and somehow capitalism takes the blame for this, but they're 
could not have been any monopolies in this country without the U.S. government establishing those monopolies. Uh, and so, uh, and, and then for some reason they blame capitalism for this. <clears throat> but this is where the, the country began to go wrong, was in establishing monopolies. And those monopolies led to other things that were also very bad, including things like the Great Depression and so forth. And so then we wind up uh, in a situation like we're in today. We don't live under capitalism, although most people think we do. Uh, we don't live under socialism, although an awfully lot of people would like for us to. Uh, but the, but the, the fact is that uh, we, we are living in a very mixed up kind of system where no one of them really prevails. And uh, by the way, it was Lenin who said if you want to uh, conquer another country, first go in and confuse their language. And uh, witness, if you will, back in the 1960s, we got a whole bunch of new words that was brought about by the hippies. Things like uh, to steal became rip off and uh, other such uh, uh, expressions that replaced the long established expressions that we had had so that oftentimes an older person couldn't understand a younger person and so on. Uh, and it makes for more confusion. Uh, and that leads to things like the Chinese stealing our information from our computers and so forth. We're in a horribly confused state and we need to readjust ourselves to go back to some kind of normalcy. Thank you. All right. The whole world seems to be this tug of war going on here. It's just so many people who just can't make it in this world. It's uh, not the people who are fierce. Some people are just too good, to, better than others. They think a couple are successful. Uh, I think we need to find the right balance here. Uh, one thing, one size doesn't fit all. Too much government's not going to be any good. You want to have bureaucracies running your systems and everything else through, through, through socialism? Too much capitalism is not any good. You want some individual, own, you know, 60 percent of the land and this and that. So we got to look for the right balance. It's, uh, it, it's. I, I like to think that, that there's some things that work better with socialism. I mean, there's, 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 you can work with both too. You can work with uh, public education, private education, public transportation, private transportation, um, many other things. You can sell with the private. You got to mix them both. You got to find the best mix. For what works for the best. Um, the one thing I like to keep in mind is that you must have free enterprise. What I mean by that is give individuals that opportunity to have those ideas. They go out and they create their own job. They create jobs for other people. They have ideas about something. Uh, you say uh, all these car companies came and they went out of business. People really got hurt and lost money. But the thing is, if somebody came along and made a car, somebody made a better car. Somebody had improvement on it. It kept going on and on and on. It was improvement, growth, and change. It was, you work with all of them. It's a, it's a mixed uh, it's a very really mixed bag, very uh, complex. Only have one. And I say that's not get involved is just one thought. I mean split it up and realize there's some good in both. One side doesn't fit at all. We got we gotta find the right balance. And we have the best thing in this country you got the well, the best government's working for it. I mean we don't like it all the time. We can change it. You can vote it out of it, you can participate in it. And uh, we do have one of the best economy in the world. That energy, free, uh, capitalism is a bad word for free enterprise. It does work. It works for some people. Now, now, a lot of people benefit from it. A lot of people, some guy makes a, 
who creates a product or something and sells it, he makes a ton of money out of it. But uh, some of that product, there's people lining up outside his uh, door for 2 o'clock in the morning. What about the guy in front of his stores? It happened. Now, you, you've got to fine tune it. You have to have the government's got to step in and, and make corrections on these things. You've got to have good democratic law in this. But I'm trying to point out capitalism. I'm not, I'm not in favor of capitalism for these multimillionaires. But the thing I'm trying to point out is free enterprise. You've got to keep that, that door of opportunity open for those individuals that come up with those ideas. There's just a few people in the world that come up with certain ideas. Not everybody participates in this. Somebody want to make, make a, new, uh, a new microphone or whatever. He has an idea to do it. You've got to give them the freedom and the opportunity to do that. If you've if you got too much government regulations, no, you can't do it. You've got to work with this system or that system. It, it doesn't materialize. It's, uh, it's a mix. No, you got to find the right mix. Between. Uh, right, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Give yourself a chance to hear it, you know? All right, that's going to uh, preface me. Well, first of all, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. The world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under the order from a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history where they have had capitalism and largely free trade, if you want to know the reasons the masses are worse off, worst off, it's exactly the kinds of societies that depart from that. So the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of ordinary people that can hold the candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by the free enterprise system. Milton Friedman. There are those of us who are privileged to live in different countries have grown appreciably richer in the last few past few decades. So too at the third world. Rich, but the second half is quite simply wrong. The poor have not, generally speaking, come to be worse off in recent decades. On the contrary, absolute poverty has diminished. And where it was quantitatively greatest in Asia, many hundreds of people have, barely 20 years ago, were struggling to make ends meet, have begun to achieve a, a secure existence, even in the midst, even a modest degree of affluence. You see, it's all about something else. We forget where we're coming from. Johann Norberg, in his book, The Ten Reasons to Look Forward to the Future, says this, according, I'm sorry, the paper, okay, wait a minute here. On average, five years, at, okay, wait a minute. There's a wonderful paper published by Jim Oppen and James Vogel looks at the forecasts of experts, including the United Nations and the World Bank, who have repeatedly asserted that life existence, that life expectancy is approaching a ceiling. The paper concludes that these ceilings have all, always been broken on average, five years after the estimate was published. Oppen and Dample point out that female life expectancy in the record-holding country has risen an amazing 160 years at a steady pace of almost three months per year, and there is no end in sight. The apparent leveling off in some countries is an artifact of laggards catching up and leaving and leaders falling behind. Amazingly, there is not a single country in the world that hasn't seen improvements in infant or death mortality since 19, since about the 1950s and the 1920s. And despite what we hear in the news and from any authorities, 
the great story of our era we are witnessing is the greatest improvement stand the greatest improvement in global living standards ever to take place. Poverty will probably be eradicated in the next 10 to 15 years. You see, what I believe is this. When we're em embracing global trade, when we're basically embracing a free enterprise system, we will see the end of abject poverty. We will see a world coming into its own a little more. And yes, I do see a solution to global warming. It may, it may come through a plethora of renewable energy going up and the price coming down through competition. I happen to think it's going to be through some alternative form of nuclear power that will come from Wall Street that will be safe and effective because nobody's going to want to build if it's not safe and effective. And significantly, the corporations have a vested interest in keeping their customers happy. Oh, if yeah. they don't, they'll be out of business very soon. If you don't believe me, take a look at what Amazon's doing. They're trying to enhance their customer experience so <coughs> good that sometimes to the detriment of the many small companies that partner with them, including, uh, may I ask, eBay as well. All right. Let's thank our speakers. Thank, uh, thanks, Sid, for a nice uh, hey, the round there. I'll be eclectic as usual here. You're not uh, ending, are you? I'll put that in your pipe and smoke it. He uh, uh, just mentioned Amazon, possibly the worst employer in the United States, among even the countries, other other countries, is Amazon. And he talks about pleasing the customer. Why don't you try pleasing the people that work there? That make that guy rich. That's your capitalism that works. Why the who plots capitalism? You gotta be nuts. You gotta be completely nuts here. Now I'll go through some of these here. Um, You're dead wrong though. Change. I'm sorry. The only change that matters is progress. That type of complication that we call progress. There's change in the world, certainly. Uh, but the one that we identify and we try to focus on. It's that type of change and complication which is called progress. Um, to say that, well, we have to have a hundred car companies for one to succeed, and that's your system that you're proposing. And say, oh yes, but we got a good car out of it. Uh, what about the people that were unemployed, that took jobs there? So they just cast aside, I guess they don't really count. The people that worked in those 99 companies that closed they don't matter. They're just, they're just utilitarian things that we can just say, oh, here, that's okay. Now, the other thing I heard is that, oh, the government creates monopolies. Uh, for 35 years, I worked with the Code of the United States, the laws. I knew of no law. I worked with these every day in which the United States government passed the law creating monopoly. What in the world is are you talking about here? Now the railroads had a monopoly. Yes, in the sense that you don't need two railroads on, on either side of town. They they had railroads broken up because they use them in a domain. That's not really monopoly. Monopolies were, were created in the steel industry, in the petroleum industry, by who? the capitalist one percenters that you applaud and say, oh, these are wonderful men and they're working out for the good of America or something. They are working out for the good of themselves. Don't you understand that? Can't you comprehend that? Do you not realize it? Yeah, they don't care about you. They do never have cared about you and they will never care about you. And you think somehow magically by this process, focused on the benefit of one individual, that it will be good for you. I don't understand how it's this miracle takes place. Uh, yet there's no technological development in socialism. Well, I seem to recollect that a socialist country put up a satellite. I seem to recollect that a socialist country, actually they could have been the first one to put a man on the moon. They held back. 
but you find it inconceivable that there could be any progress other than the research of some, some venture capitalist. Let me, now let me tell you about another thing I'm reading here. I'm, on the way down here, I'm reading about the wonderful capitalist system. <laughs> this is the history of a government agency, the United States Postal Service. It was going in real good, Ben Franklin and all this, setting it up, new country, working fine. Then somebody said, why don't we have some contracts with private sector, like stagecoaches or canal boats or something, for transporting. That's when it went into a disaster because they encountered nothing but capitalists who were crooks <laughs> and didn't care about postage or delivering letters. What's the price that, what's that book? What's the title? It's the, how the post taken you later. But that, that's what I mean. And you're telling me, now the last thing I want to talk about is this thing about testimony now. The president says, I'm not going to testify. Oh no, it's a trap. And I'm not having any cabinet official. I was thinking, Hillary Clinton spent eight hours, I watched this on C-SPAN, testifying before a congressional committee. There were two committees. They spent $10 million and $17 million, and she had no hesitancy about going up for them and answering each and every question they had for the entire day or two, if not longer. Now you've got a guy who adamantly refuses to testify at all, to give any sort of deposition. Now you've got to say why. If I was representing somebody and they're totally innocent, I would want them to give a deposition. Yeah. One other thing I'll tell you, in the federal sector, there's a code of ethics, and I can't understand this. If I had an employee that told a lie, did not tell the truth, the only thing I'd recommend to them is to quit right. and get out and hopefully avoid any sort of punishment, and I mean that. These guys don't ever tell the truth. They want, them, they want that guy to come back to testify because everything he said in the beginning they discovered was a lie. And this is, what we, this is where our standards have come down to. And anybody who applauds what's going on here, it's, 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 I'm serious. There is a thing called the Code of Ethics. It applies to all federal employees. And I don't understand why it's not being applied here. But anyhow, thanks a lot. Come again, we're gonna see you again. Uh, yeah, um, Sid, take care. Charlie, I can still yeah. answer your quote about capitalism. Yeah, sure. Go, according to go, David, go according to David Sarnoff, yeah. capitalism yeah. brings yeah. out the worst yeah. in people, but the best in products. Yeah, but what, at what cost? Uh, yeah, tell, tell the employees of uh, Amazon. You know what? Is working. Jeff Bezos is now putting them in at fifteen dollars an hour now. Due to the pressure that yeah, and that's all they give up. No pension, no health benefits, nothing. Yeah. Anything happens to them, they are on deep duty. Right. I'm glad Chicago lost that contract. Fifteen dollars an hour, incidentally, is two thirds Sorry. of a minimum wage. And they put those. those well, we're fighting fight for two thirds that, 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 of a minimum wage. That, that, that and keep organizing. Get started. Okay. Keep organizing. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, Thanks for your great talk, Sid. I really, I've always, you're one of my favorite people here because I, I agree with your socialist or socialist perspective and uh, I've learned a whole lot from you. I, I really uh, would like to even, I wish I could have asked a few more questions. I, I, as a lot of y'all know, I, my background, I was raised by a libertarian, uh, neoliberal, Milton Friedman, Ayn Rand, uh, capitalist, free enterprise, um, and my, I spent my whole, you know, ages 10 to 40 basically kind of arguing with my stepfather on this. He was, had a research for Oppenheimer, and um, which, and then, but only in hindsight, I think as, after 2008, after, uh, it, it started seeming, I remember I'd ask him, you know, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, what's, I mean, oh, no, they're not. You know, and I, I think he really was more in denial later, you know. Um, and denial is the word. I, you know, the economy didn't feel good, but he'd say, look, the stock market's up. And, um, and so he was happy. And I realized, I'd hear him 
this kind of cult. He got taken in by this lieutenant governor of New York, a real like sweetheart of the Republican Party, but really a Trump uh, pundit, <laughs> Fox News pundit. And really, I, I started to, I, I think it's like what, when I realized it's fascism is what they have become. Uh, you know, Hitler uh, talked about the big lies. It was easy once you had the big lies in the media. I, just this little children's book, Hitler and the Nazis. And I hadn't really thought about how the media helped Hitler. But I, the more I look into it, it they, if they could capture the media through editors and publishers. Back in Hitler's time, it was Charles Luce and the um, you know the editors of the papers. Don't make me. George Seldes does a great job of writing about this. Um, and it, if they captured, if we've got a media monopoly, which is what uh, you know they call this, that is that's the danger. That's what Jefferson said. Watch out for the media. You know, I'd rather have a free. Free newspapers, you know, let the government pays for it, right? Um, and yeah. there's a, that's not monopoly government. That, that is, um, that's the role of government, you know. To, uh, you know, even Milton Friedman and you know the neoliberals would agree with this that there's a role for certain utilities, you know, to be handled because it's not really competitive, you know. Um, Oh, energy okay. distribution, I work for the energy companies, it, you know, you supply and, you know, do it as cheaply as possible. I actually was a researcher for deregulation of energy and, you know, coming from my Ayn Rand background, I'm like, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with deregulating it. Um, the CEO didn't care, uh, nobody else cared, you know, Exxon was for it, you know, George, People's Energy was for it. It's only when you go back and look at why did they regulate in the first place? You got to go forensic history. Go back to the 1900s, and um, it's because there was an abuse of power at the top, right? That um, they had to. The government's role was to regulate it so that the abuse of power by the managers <clears throat> did not, you know, cause. I mean, it would be fascism, right? They were like, we don't want fascism. That's not good economics. That's not good. It was kind of good for a while, I guess. And if you're a Nazi, you know, in Germany, it worked out pretty good. But what we have to have is what we, you talked about what we had in the U.S. In the 40s, they had, you know, a graduated income tax, a tax, um, you know, 40-something percent at the highest, you know, corporations were higher. Now, with deregulation of the whole thing, put in by the neoliberals, William Buckley started the manager's revolution, wrote about it, and um, the CIA sponsored that. This is, this is military, and military government, military, this is fascism, right? Corporate military control captures the government and makes it a, you know, in a coup d'etat, but you don't see it because it's CIA. That, that's not good for the economy, right? That's what needs to be regulated, but I can't figure out how to regulate it. Get rid of that corrupt that Nazi takeover of our country. That's what we have to get to free speech and figure that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You already talked about Okay. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thanks again, Sid. Turn off the vacuum. All right, the Turn off the vacuum. Awesome. Uh, so, start with um, this is a book published uh, in the early 1990s by Bookmarks, the imprint of what used to be the sister party of the International Socialist Organization, uh, the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain, but it's in defense of October with a C for the defense because it's British spelling, a debate on the Russian Revolution. And I recommend this to a lot of the progressives and, and uh, left-wingers and Marxists in the room of various shadings because this is a completely non-conservative debate uh, or non-libertarian, non-free market, whatever. Uh, and one of my favorite is one of the rebuttals to the main author who is 
a Trotskyist speaking in favor of the Soviets, who was reviewing all of the horrid things that Lenin had done in 1921, 22, 23. And I wanted to bring these up also because this was after they'd won the Civil War, and there were really two chances that the Bolsheviks had uh, right at the beginning after they had seized power. They convened the Constituent Assembly, and they held the elections in late 1917, and they lost. I mean, they came in a, it was a you know, multi-party election. They came in a strong second with just under a quarter of the vote, and there was a much larger agrarian socialist party that came, had about 40% of the vote and a lot more of the delegates. So at the first meeting of the con, con, uh, Constituent Assembly by January of 1918, you know, the right-wing monarchist officers were already starting to gear up against the Bolsheviks. The Allies were starting to take over the ports. World War I was still going. Uh, and the Constituent Assembly split. Uh, some of the left-wing delegates from the other parties, like the Mensheviks and the Socialist Revolutionaries, supported the Bolsheviks. Some didn't. And they plunged into civil war, and it was totalitarian ever after. But it's after the civil war is over, and after the czarist armies and this unholy alliance or unstable alliance of the uh, left-wing non-Bolsheviks and the right-wing monarchists has fallen apart, it's been defeated, the Allied intervention is all pulled out of the major port cities. That's when the sailors at Kronstadt, who had helped inaugurate the first rebellion in 1917 against the Tsar, uh, and even going back, I think, to the 1905 revolution in Russia, demanded new elections to the Soviets, and they no longer had an excuse to not have new elections to these governing bodies, because all the other parties were defeated, uh, all of the foreign enemies had left the ports, and instead, Trotsky and the Red Guards helped crush the sailors at the Kronstadt Uprising. They implemented the new economic policy, which allowed farmers to keep some of their surplus for a while, basically what China would do in 1978 or 80. Um, and instead, later, Stalin reversed course. But they, they had a chance to redirect the system with the new economic policy, and instead they tightened the state. So this is a good short book, again, from left-wing perspectives on that subject. Um, this one is from 1943 by a man who was a muckraking journalist and a Georgist and later became a critic of the New Deal. His name's Albert J. Nock. Um, but his career spanned as a writer from about 1910 to his death in the, uh, right at the end of World War II. Socialism and one or two other variants of collectivist statism were making considerable political progress at this time. When I met some of their proponents, as I did now and then, I would put the one question to them that I always put to Henry George's campaigners. Suppose by some miracle you have your system all installed, complete, and perfect. It will still have to be administered. Very well. What kind of people can you get to administer it, except the kind of people you've got? I never had an answer to that question. In a society of just men made perfect, and I suppose I could insert here men and women and persons of non-conforming genders, uh, if I were updating the language. In a society made perfect, George's system would be administered admirably and would work like clockwork. So would socialism. So would any other form of collectivism. In such a society, the quote-unquote dictatorship of the proletariat would be a splendid success for everybody all around. The trouble is, we have no such society. Far from it. Although I was, and am, a firm believer in George's philosophy and fiscal method, I decided that if progressive evolution was to make them practicable in 50,000 years, it would have to step a great deal livelier than there was any sign of its doing. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, ma'am, I'm afraid I don't know your name, but I've heard you in a couple of these forums. Adam, nice to meet you. Um, the Goose Laying the Golden Egg, and that reminded me also of the Russia Connection. That was the title of a talk that used to be given by Max Eastman. If anyone knows the name, he was Trotsky's translator for many years, and then later on uh, an anti-communist and a critic of, uh, of communism. Is that my time? Yeah. Thank you very kindly, folks. And thank you, Mr. Cohen.
plenty of people that administer socialism. That's no problem. Yeah. Well, I have your authority. Yeah, a guy like me. Thanks, I, Sid. Dozens yeah. of them. For a good talk tonight. It's a good segment of history. As I've been saying for oh, yeah. since 2007, there's books published on censored news showing how the media maintains people in a bubble. So Americans are divided. You know, Americans living inside the bubble, it's hard to step through it for some people and learn the reality on many different subjects. Here's a book that was published in 1980. It's called Unavailable at Any Price. For people that still think that nuclear power has any future at all, I would examine this book. It says, you can't buy in home insurance. You know, there's a little clause in every home insurance policy that says any nuclear damage is not covered by the homeowner policy. Uh -huh. If you, you live near a nuclear plant and uh, like Chernobyl, we have that and it contaminates your property, it's not insured. You have to absorb that debt and walk away and your house is wiped out. Did you hear that? Oh, I heard it. And, and, and that's not so the only that, problem. That goes for any nuclear technology oh, until yeah, you yeah. can line up, oh, until that's Wall that's Street and the big insurance yeah, companies start insuring it. There is absolutely no future for any kind of nuclear power. Now, not, not in the near future, maybe 50 years from now. It'll take 20 years to iron out the bugs of thorium. If it turns out to be clean, safe, and too cheap to meter, great. This book describes, this is the end device. It's new, last month, it describes how fast the ice is melting at the North, South Pole, and Greenland. We got 11 years to get off fossil fuel and go solar and wind power and just stop burning fossil fuel mostly, get off most of it by 2030, or the window of opportunity for <laughs> stopping climate disaster closes. Tim wasn't here when I just said, we're divided, we live in a bubble, and some people believe something that's not real on this subject. Some people believe something that's not real over here. We used to be uh, divided. Some Catholic churches were uh, heavily divided between the people that supported the pedophile priest and the peace people that didn't. Today, let's have a show of hands here. Who thinks the pedophile priests are doing a good job with our kids? Anybody, anybody here support the pedal? Uh, do, you, do you know somebody that's a pedophile priest? You think they're doing a good job? I think they're doing a good job. Yeah, that's that's a humorous quote. But in, in the general population, pedophiles and child molesters don't last long in prison. That's a universally accepted, hated human quality. Anybody that molests or tortures a small child, they don't last long among the prison population if they get prosecuted and sent to prison. That's why there's a whole bunch of pedophiles that have been protected by the highest officials in our land right now, in Congress, all the way to the Bush White House when George H.W. Bush was in there. Um, it's a scandal of epic proportions among high-level politicians, and now the people that want to change this and hold politicians accountable, they're being massively attacked by the corporate press right now. I've talked to people that are otherwise educated to think that the woman called AOC is, oh, she's just crazy. She doesn't care about yeah. the American public. And anybody that thinks AOC crazy, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, doesn't understand two things. One, she's risking her life by ruffling the feathers of the drug and, oh. and fossil fuel industry. The Ilhan Omar, another freshman representative, is getting regular death threats. These progressives that don't go along with the corporate program are getting death threats. They, any one of them could become the second, um, the next Senator Wellstone. Paul Wellstone from Minnesota was the conscience of the Senate. Senator Paul Wellstone, his, his private plane with his wife and family was shot down 10 days before the election. They installed a, they installed a, uh, a Republican to keep control, 51 to 49 percent, from the criminally operated Senate of the Bush Cheney operation. So, this book and others describe how fast the ice is melting and also how fast solar and wind power, now cheaper than any kind of fossil fuel, cheaper than any kind of nuclear power, is revolutionizing energy production all across the world. 
and people living in a bubble still promoting fossil or nuclear don't know this. They haven't looked at the actual facts. They don't know what the costs are. They don't know what the numbers are. And so we keep having debates like whether the earth is flat or round because people refuse to look at the evidence. It's more comfortable to just live in a bubble. I tell any, you know, one last thing. If I can find it, it was right here. Uh, Jeff, there was a man named Jeffrey Epstein who ran a, a, a something called the Lolita Express. Uh, he's a billionaire. They had an island offshore, and he would uh, he had his private jet taking high-ranking officials, entertainers, uh, out to an island to have sex with underage girls. Well, I think Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi, I think they're both waiting and hoping that a videotape emerges so they don't have to take the heat for impeaching Donald Trump. They're waiting for a video showing Trump having sex with a nine-year-old girl. That's the only thing that's going to have qualified for impeachment. doesn't matter about his panorama of all kinds of crimes. It's not about Last Trump words. anymore, it's about us. 300 million of us. We are tolerating no, this for some odd ball reason. No, no, and the rest no, of the world no, is looking no, at no, us. No, Does that make any sense to no, any people here? No. 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 Look at his taxes. Okay. No, you, know, you say we as voters aren't so responsible for no, Trump? Is that what all you were saying? Well, they're running on We voted party. him in well, and we're not great. responsible for voting him out. Go to the chair. I would log, log on to the website called Extinction right, Rebellion and look at what these kids are doing. Millions of them. We have one more brief speaker and then Sid gets his final word. No, I can be brief because I'm always brief, but um, I just wanted to say I was thinking Andy is not on point. He's digressing. He's bringing in, you know, things that are not relevant. But I think actually that he is totally accurate in that it's it's not the old isms that we have to we have to develop we have to balance but we have to get rid of the old isms socialism communism um, libertarianism and we have to focus on the real issue which is humanitarianism which is the concern for all people and this planet. Um, and maybe that was apparent to you all, but it's like not the state is not so so important in that, except in that it needs to assist with our main goal, which is survival of the planet and us. Okay. Right. Tim, you get the last word. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> 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 quick summary, Sid. I think you said it all before, but uh, yeah. Well, uh, actually, I never said that capitalism isn't better than slavery. And I never said that feudalism isn't better than slavery. What I said was, they're all forms of slavery. But outright slavery is a lot worse than feudalism, and capitalism is a lot better than feudalism. So it's an advance in industrial development, and it gives a chance for us to develop into a higher form of society, which is socialism. And if we don't go into that higher form, if we stay awake we are, we're going to destroy the whole planet and everything in it. So either you go toward the higher form of society or you die with capitalism. Thank you. All right, I'm going to close this out, Andy. I'll close this out. Can't really call it Yeah. I'm going to close on a word of hope tonight. I will close on a word of hope. After 15 innings today at Wrigley Field, the Chicago Cubs won the game against Milwaukee Brewers, and they're now first in the National League Central. With that, we're adjourned. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,